Breaker Breaker, we have some scary stories on the horizon. Welcome back to the swamp, my friends. It's good to see that you made it back for another episode. Today I'm going to be sharing some creepy and allegedly true truck driver horror stories. As always, if you have a story that you would like to share in a future video, be sure to submit it at swampdweller.net. I'd love to share your stories with everyone here in the swamp. Now. Let's get into these allegedly true and creepy truck driving horror stories. Well, first I would like to start off by saying that I am a truck driver and I've grown up around the trucking industry and have plenty of experiences I can share. I have stopped listening to music while I drive and I've just been playing Swamp Dweller episodes. My personal experiences do not seem to be horror stories really, but this one could have really been for the worse. Not long after I got my CDL, I was taking a trip from Texas to Pennsylvania. Part of that route is I-44. For those who do not know, a good part of Interstate 44 is the old historical Route 66. Anyway, I was on the toll road part in Oklahoma, just driving listening to Swamp Dweller episodes. I had my CB radio turned off at the time. I know this because of what I did in this situation. I came across a woman waving me down on the side of the road beside a car with its hood up. I started gearing down and getting ready to pull over in behind her so I could help her. As I slowed down, I heard a voice on my CB say, Don't stop. I grabbed the mic and was going to ask why when I looked at my CB and saw that it was off. I then heard again. Don't stop. Keep driving. Not sure what to do, I decided to pull in front of the car instead of behind it. As I pulled past, I saw a man crouched in front of the car with a shotgun. Some mysterious voice saved my life that day. This next one comes from a driver I grew up with. To keep his anonymity, I will use his handle, Big John. In the late 1980s, Big John was working heavy haul. That could be wide loads, heavy stuff, tall loads, or a combination of any. During this time, he was hauling a dozer from the oil fields of Colorado to another location in South Dakota. On his way down a windy, steep, mountainous road above Colorado Springs, he was called out by his lead pilot car to either stop immediately or do not let off until you get to the interstate. Since Big John's load was heavy, he just kept going as not to lose momentum. It is at this point when he recounts his story that he always gets that thousand yard stare that makes what happened next not very difficult to believe. Big John says that when he came over the next peak, before heading down the next steep grade, he saw a young girl in a white dress with long black hair just standing in the middle of the road, holding a teddy bear by her side. His pilot car screamed on the CB to just keep going. Do not swerve, she is not real. He pauses and takes a deep breath and sighs. His exact words every time are, I hit that little girl, but she didn't go under the rig. I hit her, but she didn't go under the truck. According to his recount, the little girl was still standing in the road behind his rig when he passed, and she was just waving at him in his mirror. Being a driver myself these days, I understand much better why this tears him apart. People who genuinely care about the way they handle their rigs would as soon drive off a cliff and destroy any chance of keeping a job, let alone their own life before hitting anyone on purpose. And to intentionally drive into a little girl would kill whatever bit of your soul you have left. I can only imagine how it has really affected Big John since he quit driving not long after this incident. He said, that what made it even crazier was his follow car drove through the girl too, but did not even see her. Big John always finishes by whispering, There's some crazy stuff out there, man. If you're going to drive one of those big trucks, make sure you can trust yourself. Hey, Swamp Dweller. I have a story for you. Unfortunately, it is kind of short and kind of anticlimactic, but I do believe it might fit into one of your videos, as it is pretty creepy. 
So, I'm a truck driver and I absolutely love it. I was driving westbound on I-70 in Utah. It was dark and the rain made it for a miserable ride. I made it to the last exit on I-70 before I-15 interchange and called it a night on an off-ramp about 25 miles north of a town called Beaver, Utah. Yeah, I know it's not very safe, but there is really a trucker parking shortage out here. It's pretty pitiful. Anyways, back to the story. I called it a night, and I'm winding down from the long day of grinding, and I'm just sitting in the captain's chair in the dark with no lights on. On this exit ramp, essentially, it is the middle of nowhere, just open pastures and mountains surrounding me. So sitting in my chair, I suddenly started catching movement out of the corner of my eye. I just chalked it up to possibly something like cows, or maybe my imagination. I did my best to blow it off, and continued sitting there talking with my wife, which was with me by the way. I kept catching movement repeatedly though, and finally I decided to tell my wife about it. She just got up and closed the windshield curtains, I have something like that to keep privacy for myself. She just said, let's go to bed, it's been a long day. That was the end of the night, and we went to bed. The next morning we woke up and chatted for a bit. She told me she heard a couple of bangs outside. She said it sounded like someone banging on the trailer. So, we're chatting along when suddenly there are three knocks on my driver's side door. So I get up and open the curtain. There was absolutely nobody there. I got up to answer quickly because I was thinking, maybe it's a cop ready to tell me that I need to get out of this. Maybe it's some sort of private land and I can't park here. I am getting these goosebumps just typing this right now. I'm in the middle of nowhere. There's not a soul around. I'm looking around and in my side mirrors and everything and there was nobody there at all. I look at my wife and I said, what the hell is going on? There's no one here. She got up and looked around as well and said, what the hell? Swamp Dweller, I want you to know that I booked it out of there quicker than all get out, man. 100% truth behind this. I am a horrible liar and not much of a storyteller. I know. I know this was not much of a story, but it was creepy to me. At least I think so. In case you are wondering, I did not open the door, nor did I get out to investigate. I probably should have, and next time, maybe I just might do that. So my trucking route is from here in Connecticut all the way down to Kentucky and Tennessee. It is a good run. I get to see pretty much all the sights the East Coast has to offer. But there is one area of the country that gets wild, and that area is around the Appalachian Mountains. You guys probably know that it is one of the poorest areas of the country, one that got really screwed over as the coal mining jobs started to dwindle and the local economy went down the crapper. I really feel for those people down there. Seeing how entrenched in poverty some of the families are is just so heartbreaking. So, I was rolling through an area of the state that I had not previously been through. Thanks to my usual section of highway being blocked off by some huge traffic accident that had unfortunately left a few people dead. I was having trouble navigating the roads after my phone ran out of battery and would not be able to plug the charger in. It was the worst timing ever. But I was an experienced truck driver, and I was not driving an 18-wheeler on that run, so I was free to take some of the smaller roads to find my way around. But even though I consider myself surprisingly good on the roads, there was a certain point that I found myself hopelessly lost, and I started to worry that I might not be making my shipping delivery deadline. That would mean disciplinary proceedings and whatnot, and I just could not afford those at all. So anyway... I happened to see this one guy wandering down the side of the road, so I slow my truck down, wind down the window, and ask him for directions. The guy seems friendly enough and is more than willing to take a few minutes to give me all the information I need on how to make it back onto the main highways that headed south. But then, I start asking him if there is anywhere nearby that I would be able to get some lunch, as it was getting towards one in the afternoon and I had only managed to get myself a pretty meager breakfast. The guy seems to think for a moment, scratching his head, taking an unusually long time to think of an answer to a question that usually takes just a few seconds. It is rare to be anywhere in West Virginia where there is not a cracker barrel within a few miles, so why he did not just point me in the direction of one of those was beyond me. 
When I pressed him a bit, he told me he knew of an old family run place that had the best chicken fried steak in the entire county, maybe even the state. Suddenly all was forgiven. I might be a northerner, but I will be damned if I turn down a good chicken fried steak. All that was taking so long was for him to try and remember the best way that would take me there. Apparently, I had to go down some run-down, old dirt road, one which might get my truck stuck on it, which really would have left me screwed. So after a minute, he gives me some detailed directions towards an old strip mall. He told me it was mostly abandoned, but the restaurant was still there, along with a few other smaller businesses, and not to pay any mind if the place seemed quiet during lunch, as it did much of its business in the early to late evening. I was happy enough, thanked the guy, then set off following the directions he had given me. It took me a little while to find the old strip mall the guy was talking about. It was honestly a little frustrating to drive past a couple of chain restaurants and whatnot, given that I was so hungry. But if I was not craving some of that country-style chicken fried steak, and if that was a family-run place, then all the better. The chain restaurant stuff just does not cut it compared to the real, home-style cooking. But eventually, I find this run-down old strip mall the guy seemed to be talking about, and it was little wonder the place was in such a state of disrepair. It was way off any highway. There was absolutely no signage for it. Literally nothing to let anyone know that it was even there. But even worse, I saw zero indication that there was any kind of restaurant open in any of the units. I was not about to give up so easily though, as I did see a place that had a big old sign over it saying something like Mama J's Country Kitchen or some variation of that. So my hopes were restored a bit. That is when I see a guy step out of the door going into the afternoon heat and staring over at my truck. I gave him away from the driver's side, overjoyed that I'd finally found out that this place was real and maybe some decent food would be here soon. This was a lonely drive down from Connecticut after all. I figured he had not seen me do it. The sun was obscuring his vision or something because he just continued to stare back at me. Anyway, I get out of my truck, lock the doors and start walking over to the restaurant. I call out to the guy about halfway across the parking lot asking if they were indeed open for business. Again, the guy does not react. He just keeps staring at me in a way that I now notice is distinctly unwelcoming. Something in my gut just told me to stop walking. I had this creeping feeling all over my body, like something was telling me that something was horribly wrong with this whole setup. And no sooner had I started feeling that distinct vulnerability, the guy reached behind his back and pulled something out of his back pocket and puts it on his head. I thought it was likely a woolly hat at first, but when he pulls it down, it's a balaclava. Then I noticed something else in his hand. It's a small revolver. I turn and start running back to my truck, and as I do, I see a few other guys emerging from the derelict units, each running towards my truck and trying to cut me off. Each had a weapon in their hand, be it a knife or an iron bar, and seeing these just made me run even faster. Thank God I had gotten that gut feeling when I did, otherwise they would have made it to my truck far before I did. I threw the door open, jumped inside, and locked the cab behind me. Trembling as I rummaged in my pocket for the keys, the bandits surrounded the cab of my truck, hitting the chassis with their weapons and demanding I get out. Then the guy with the gun aimed the thing right at my face, through the windshield, screaming for me to get out of the truck. I had no choice but to do what I did. I gunned the engine and plowed through the bunch of them, knocking down those who did not jump out of the way in time. I leaned down in my seat and grabbed the wheel, out of pure instinct really, and again, I thank God that I did, because when I hit the guy with the gun, he let loose a single shot that shattered the windshield and struck the seat just above my head. I circled around the parking lot, expecting the next shot to come at any moment, but only the bandits that had gotten out of my way in the initial truck charge were chasing me. Two or three were just lying on the concrete, rolling around in pain, whilst holding their limbs. I think that is about the only thing that saved me. Having the presence of mind to just ram them instead of trying to reverse out of there. If that had been my choice, I might not be around to tell you this story at all. I got the hell out of that parking lot, speeding off blindly in the first direction I could, until I found somewhere to safely park up and call the cops. The sheriff's deputy I spoke to told me to swing on by the department when I was able to, so I could give a statement, and so I did. 
but not until I managed to get myself some lunch, as not even the terror of almost getting hijacked could dull my appetite. I guess that just makes me fat or whatever, but you guys need to appreciate just how hungry I truly was. Down at the department, however, I learned that I was not the first truck driver to be targeted by these bandits. How I had just been unlucky enough to ask directions from one of their kinfolk who had directed me to the rundown strip mall just before calling his buddies to let them know I would be there. At least, that is the only conclusion we came to once I had described the guy I had asked directions from. The deputy just seemed to nod knowingly when I related this guy's physical description. I guess I'm just warning you guys to be incredibly careful when you're out on those roads. And although it seems like some tired old cautionary tale from your Facebook posting aunt, be careful when you are talking to strangers. There is no way of knowing just who they truly are. I'm a long haul truck driver so I am no stranger to the states and I have seen things I cannot explain but this is by far the weirdest thing to ever happen to me. So to get straight to the point. I was driving through Arizona, heading westbound on I-40. I had finally hit Flagstaff and go out at a truck stop and handled my business. As I left from Flagstaff, I ran by mile marker 185. It is about 10 miles from Flagstaff, Arizona. As I passed mile marker 185, there was what seemed to be a person hitchhiking. The only problem was, this guy was huge easily eight feet tall or so, looking straight into the passenger window of my semi-truck. On top of that, it seemed to be as wide as the truck from shoulder to shoulder. I passed the hitchhiker at 70 miles per hour, at least. I thought, probably about a half mile down the road, that I saw the same exact person or, or thing, because, once again, I had passed what seemed to be the same figure. This kept happening every 20 miles down the road or so, even past mile marker 165. I saw it every few miles. After I passed mile marker 165, I did not see it anymore though. It suddenly vanished, so I thought I was done with it. But I was dead wrong. I got down to mile marker 145. I had to take a leak, so I pulled over to the side of the road to handle my business. I was about halfway done when I heard an ear-piercing scream. It was probably a mix between what sounded like a deer and a human. As soon as I heard it, I started looking around and just outside the halo of my headlights, I saw something. I couldn't tell you what it was. I was never more confused and scared in my life. I tried very hard in that moment to figure out what it was, even when I heard something flying. Suddenly, I heard a loud thump, and sitting three feet away from me was a huge rock the size of a basketball. It had to at least have been 80 pounds or so. When I saw that, I pretty much got the heck out of there as fast as I could. That thing threw that rock at me with such force that when it hit the ground, it literally bounced back up into the air a few feet. I just was terrified. It landed only three feet away from me. I wasted little time trying to hop back into my truck and get away from whatever that thing was. As I passed it, it just stared me down and I never saw it again. Can anyone please tell me what I saw? And thank you so much for sharing my story if you do. I've been a long haul trucker for a good few years now. I find it enjoyable to be honest. It just suits my lifestyle. I've never really been the most sociable person, so I really like the whole thing of it just being me with nothing but my stereo system and the open road for my company. My job has taken me to some incredible places as well. Things that regular 9 to 5 office workers just never get to see from their dusty, dimly lit office spaces. Even those with the views from skyscrapers and stuff, they never see the landscape change how the sun frames mountain ranges or how the moon shimmers off boundless lakes. Even with all the built up areas, this country really is beautiful in some areas. Wyoming and Montana are some of my favorites. The mountain ranges and prairies being like picturesque postcards in places. 
but, and I mean no offense here, the Iowa cornfields get so tedious in places because there is literally nothing but cornfields as far as the eye can see. However, my least favorite place to drive in the entire country has to be Louisiana. Again, I mean absolutely no offense to any native sons of the Bayou State. I have had my good times there. I have had some of the best fried catfish I have ever tasted in little roadside diners while rolling through that place. But there is something inherently creepy about Louisiana too. Maybe it's just the humidity, the gators, or the way the Cajuns can just switch from English to French on a dime and shut you right out of the conversation. The whole southern hospitality is as real as I am surely breathing, and I really have met some of the nicest, most generous people in the entire country down in Louisiana. I am talking the kind of people that would give you their last dollar, or the shirt off their backs. But I guess it is just a place of extremes because I also met some of the least welcoming and quite frankly, most terrifying people I've ever met in my whole life down there. And this here is a story of one of those encounters, one that keeps me up at nights, and that takes a few glasses of vodka just to shut the memories out. So this one time, I'm rolling along the highway late in the evening, way behind schedule on a shipment due in Dallas, Texas. The tight timing meant it looked like I was going to have to pull another brutal all-nighter to get my load to the depot on time. But if that were going to be the case, I would have to stop at some roadside crawfish shack to fill up on greasy food and coffee, so I had the energy to keep on going. So I turned my truck off on the road, the first place I see, this place with a glowing luminous sign that flashed with half the letters missing, but it was all I needed to see. Rustin Crawfish Shack, the place was called and it was a little more than a collection of sheet metal shacks at the side of the road, if I'm honest. But hell, those were the kind of places where some Cajun mama bear has been making some of that delicious po' boy for the last 30 years. And God, I just love what those people can do with a few shrimps and a slice of lemon. So, I order up my food and get it to go. And then I sit outside to wolf it down before I get back on the road. When some older guy comes up to me and asks me where I'm from, I was friendly, and he seemed friendly as well, and I do not mean to be judgmental here, but he had very, very unusual appearance. He dressed normally, had close cropped hair, but he was very, very skinny, like unnaturally skinny, like he was just skin and bones with no muscle keeping his body upright whatsoever. I tell him up north originally, but I am based in Arkansas for my job currently and we start just casually talking about the area and its history and whatnot. He was a nice enough guy, but I had to excuse myself, telling him if I did not get this load to Dallas Depot in time, that I would be in a big world of trouble. It is the kind of thing that guys lose their jobs over, so I could not really afford to play fast and loose with my timing. And in my particular case, the risk was extra high since I had high value loads of electronics new TVs and such, and every day a delivery is late, the depot can fine a trucking company and dramatically lower their bottom line. He puzzles the thought over for a moment and then told me he thought he could help me out, and to wait here for just a moment while he fetched something from a back room of the shack. At first I thought it was going to be some pills that would help me stay up all night, but what he brought out of the crawfish shack was something that sends chills through me, even thinking about it today. The guy returned with a piece of cypress wood in his hand, like a bare piece, looking like it had been freshly cut from a tree. He had me follow him over to my truck. Out of the sight of the rest of the crowd that was gathering outside the shack, once we were alone, he pulls out this huge knife and tells me to carve my name into the wood, my full name or it won't work. It was something weird that I've never heard about. I was just about to ask him what it was when he shushes me hands me the knife, and tells me to obey. The blade looks jagged and slightly bent, like it has been forged or something. That was creepy enough on its own, but it was only when I take the knife from his hand do I see the handle and what it's made of. Y'all ever heard of a jawbone knife? It is literally what it sounds like. The blade is obviously metal, but the handle was made of an animal's jawbone. Some places it can be made of bear or cougar's jaw, with the teeth kind of blunted, so it doesn't rip up your fingers. Sounds weird, but they make for a great grip, 
and they were popular back in the old frontier days. But this jawbone knife that had been passed to me was something different. There was something horribly familiar about the size of the teeth, the way only one of them seemed to be pointed, while the others were flat or jaggedly cupped. I thought it might have been a pig's jaw at first, but the actual jawline was way too thin for that, and it was with my terror, and with my absolute horror, that I finally realized what I was looking at. It was human. That jaw had once belonged to a human being. I thought to say something, to ask him where the hell he had gotten his hands on such a thing. I mean, I wanted to shove him away and throw his wooden board right back at him. But I'm telling you, when a guy has handed you a knife that you strongly suspect is made from a freaking human being, you are not going to be anything but polite to him. So I did as I was asked. I carved my name into the wood and then handed him back the knife. All while he seemed to take immense amount of pleasure knowing how afraid I was. He then tells me that he is going to bury the piece of wood out in the bayou somewhere, and that once he had done that, I would get to Dallas with my load on time, and that I would not have to worry about a thing. So long story short, I did get to Dallas on time. I was wide awake for the entire journey. I made every exit and turn just like I was supposed to, but I was only so focused on the journey ahead because I was honestly terrified of what that knife was made out of and what I had even done. So I suppose, in a manner of speaking, the little ritual did work. Maybe not in the way he had intended it to, where some weird bayou spirits had taken care of me and, you know, maybe, like, looked over me, but it was the thing that spurred me on to get the hell away from that crawfish shack and to my destination on time. Thanks for listening to these creepy and allegedly true truck driver horror stories. If you enjoyed these stories, please be sure to hit that like button as it helps me out a ton. The more likes this video gets, the more YouTube promotes it in the algorithm, and that's super helpful. If you're listening to this on iTunes or another podcast platform, please give this a 5-star rating as it helps me grow over there. If you're new to the swamp, why not join us? Hit that subscribe button, and be sure to turn on notifications to never miss a new video, as I upload them almost every single day, and all things natural and supernatural. As always, if you have a story that you would like to share in a future video, be sure to submit it at swampdweller.net or the email you can find in the description down below. I'd love to share your story with everyone here in the swamp. Currently, I'm looking for some more deep woods and mountain range stories. Be sure to send those in so I can share them in a future video. If you guys are on the go and don't have YouTube Premium, but still want to listen to your favorite Swamp Dweller scary stories no matter where you are, you can download them absolutely free from iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher Radio, and just about everywhere else you find your favorite podcast online. And like I said, it's absolutely free and always will be. If you guys would like to support the channel outside of hitting that like button, subscribing, and giving this a 5 star rating on iTunes, maybe check out the merch store. I have everything from face masks, to t-shirts, to hoodies, and more. I'd love to see you guys wearing some cool swamp threads. Come join me on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, and more. You can find the links to do that in the description of every episode. Once again, you can submit your story at swampdweller.net. I'd love to share it, and I'll see you guys soon with another creepy video. Oh, yeah, one last thing. In the comments down below, I'd love to know what story was your favorite tonight.